Welcome everyone back to the Dark Forest. A special shout out to Matthew Bauer. A special shout out to Kathy Berkman and Edward Head, along with Leslie Johnson for picking up 10 items from my online store. And a special shout out to tonight's tale, written by Evil Monkey Ninja Gamer. Now, sit back and relax. Toast up those beautiful buns of yours. And let's get spooky. What hides in the shadows under the moon? The people go by in ignorance as a killer stalks the nights, taking one life at a time. He saw you, but you didn't see him. Amber eyes shining in the dark thick black fur as dark as midnight. A low, gut-wrenching growl wells up from his empty stomach. The cold, icy hands of night wrap around him, sounds of people coming and going not ten feet from where he waits for some poor, unsuspecting victim. He's a long way from the protection of the thick, overgrown woods where he hunts, void of any emotion other than rage and hunger that fills every inch of him. The sound of someone humming fills his long, dark, fur-covered ears. His eyes widen, his body lowers, every muscle in his athletic body tightens up. His overwhelming hunger torments him. Long, razor-sharp claws dart out from the brush, grabbing the happy man as he passes by. No one has seen what had happened to the man. The beast was fast and precise with his abduction. No cries for help were even heard from the now lifeless man, for the hungry beast had now driven his long blood-stained canines into the man's neck, silencing him in an instant. Another night goes by in the city. The beast had claimed another victim, and no one will ever know the truth of what had befallen this unlucky man. Now full and content, the beast returns to his hiding place deep in the city, the dark gives way to the light, and the beast sleeps until the moon calls him again. Don't forget when we gaze into the darkness, something hungry may gaze back at us. Being on the run, you tend to miss the little things, like the comfort of a bed, hot meals, lazy weekends with your friends, whoever said it would get easier as you go on, never really having something to lose. It's been two years now on the run, Long, endless roads, trees as far as the eye can see. The Montana wilderness was so vast you could easily get lost in it. Bears, the odd snakes here, and there may be a mountain lion or two. Just a few things to watch out for. But most people don't know what's out there. More deadly than any wild animal they could ever think of. No, I'm not talking about some everyday wolf. Even a pack of hungry wolves isn't as bad as the evil dwelling in the shadows here. Up until two years ago, you couldn't get me to go camping. But here I am today, backpacking in a lonely overgrown forest. Funny how things change. I was looking for a man who had four claw marks across his face. Tracking this man took me smack dab in the middle of Montana. I ran into a brown bear the other day looking for the reservation. An old man told me that people were going missing, pets, and livestock too. Sometimes without a trace, and other times, a real bloody mess. It had to be him doing this, so I set off to find him. When the largest brown bear you have ever seen walks out looking angry at me for having disturbed him. He stops and puts his nose up high and sniffs the air, looking at me and then walking off. I guess he could smell the evil hidden within me, and didn't want to have any part of it. The funny thing is, it didn't scare me, not one bit. Thinking of it, I started to question my sanity. Is this a sign of me losing myself, or am I at the point where I just want it all to end, and don't care if I live or die at this point? Whatever it may be, I was just changing, but not physically, but also mentally as well. I was so tired. The long day had taken its toll on me. Having walked for so many long and hot days, 
I was happy to find an abandoned barn in the woods. It was run down, old, it didn't smell too good, but it was a welcome change from sleeping on the cold, hard, unprotected ground. It wasn't much, but it would do for now. I rested my head on the makeshift pillow of hay. I closed my weary eyes, and visions of the family I left behind came rushing into my thoughts. All the memories of better times danced around in my head. No, I can't think of that. That's a life for someone who isn't a monster. I will never hurt the ones I love. I have to keep going to find the one who did this to me, I think to myself as I lay there. The cold of the night crept in as the last of my thoughts left my head. It must have been a few hours when I felt as if every fiber in my being was going to burst into flames. I start to scream out as the pain filled me from top to bottom, but I can't. My mouth won't obey me. My eyes won't open. I can't scream or see. Nothing is working. What is this? My body's not mine. It's as if I'm locked in a cage of pain and torment. The burning is killing me. I feel my bones twist and turn, shifting inside of my skin. I want to rip it off. Oh, please, someone help me. Make it stop. Then it hits me. I was so tired, I forgot what day it was. The cycle had started again. I was turning into a beast. Every time this happens to me, I see, I feel, I hear, I taste everything this monster puts me through. I am a bird in a cage, forced to see the poor animal's fate. But a part of me is still human. For all the times he had gone on a hunt, something in him was able to stop it from attacking the humans he ran across. It was only animals that the beast killed and ate. No human had fallen to this monster I have become. I feel something warm and wet run from my mouth and tastes of copper dripping from my lips. My teeth are falling out and being replaced by new ones. One after another, a new sharp dagger-like tooth pushes the old one out and tears the flesh from my gums. I still can't see what's going on. I don't even want to see what I'm becoming. Even if I tell myself this, some part is still curious and wants to see it. Someone help me, I scream to myself. My legs! I could hear the awful sound of bones snapping and twisting, beginning to regrow. Dear God, the pain. My toenails fall to the ground as new sharp hooked nails rip their way out. The pain is almost more than I could take. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I say to myself, I can't stop it. This thing will soon be free and on the hunt. What will I do if he kills someone? How will I go on knowing that I have taken a life? Even if it wasn't me, I am still to blame for this. I was so foolish to think I could do it myself. Just kill me, please. Stop me from becoming a monster. Stop this pain tearing me up inside. I didn't listen to him then, and I didn't listen to my little brother when he told me that he saw a monster in our backyard. I just wanted to show him I was a good big brother that there wasn't any monsters to be afraid of. Oh, what a fool I was to think I could go and scream out in our backyard. Go away, you big ugly monster. You are not welcome here. I looked around. Nothing was there. Just a dark, empty backyard with a big, bright, wonderful full moon overhead. Feeling proud of my well-thought-out plan to make my little brother feel safe. I turn back and look at him, wanting to see his happy face looking back at me but all I saw was a look of pure terror in his eyes. But he wasn't looking at me like that. He was looking at what had come down in the back of me from our treehouse. The monster was hiding up in it and had heard me yelling at him. The beast, being fast and as quiet as a cat, jumped down behind me. Not knowing why he was so gripped with fear, I start to turn and that's when I feel something sink its teeth into my shoulder and then picked me up and threw me across the yard. Everything starts to go black. Am I going to die? What had done this to me? Why can't I move? I feel so heavy, my body goes limp and I pass out from the pain. Two weeks later, 
I wake up to my mother sobbing and holding me. Help us, she screams. My boy is awake. The nurse runs in and starts checking everything and calls for someone to help her. I'm so confused about what was going on. My body hurts from head to toe. I try to sit up, but fall back. Everything is spinning. I can't understand where I am and why my mother is so upset. More people rush in and start messing with the equipment around me. My head hurts. I can't take it. My body shuts down and I pass out again. I wake up alone in a cold, dark room. Everyone has gone home, still dizzy. I try to sit up again. This time I can. My body doesn't hurt so much. I'm so thirsty. My lips are dry. I could hear a loud buzzing from the corner of the window. It's a fly. Why is it so loud? I could hear people talking down the hall laughing as they chat. Someone is pushing a cart down the hall. My ears. Make it stop. It's so loud. Stop it. I scream out. The nurse walks in and turns on the lights. The light is so bright it hurts my eyes. Are you cold? Can I get you another blanket? Maybe a little hungry could I get you something to eat. She turns the walk out into the hall and stops in the doorway. You're going to kill people, she tells me. What do you mean to kill people? She turns around and looks at me. Her face is full of blood and only has one eye. Long slashes in her cheeks and her nose was completely ripped off. She starts walking towards me. No! I scream out. Get away from me! Stay away! I jump up in my bed and say, Stop it! That's when I realize no one is there. The nurse is gone. I was just having a bad dream, but it felt so real. What was that? I think to myself. What was... I stopped mid-thought when the lights came on. Can I get you something? The voice of the same nurse from my dream was asking me if I needed anything. She goes about in my room checking things. You had us scared. We thought you weren't going to wake up. I'm happy to see you're still with us. Your little brother was here not too long ago. He left you a bag of cookies. Would you like some? My body tightens up as she keeps talking and walking around the room. Stop it. Your face it's... It's not all messed up, the nurse tells me with a chuckle. I didn't have time to do a good job with my makeup this morning, but I didn't think it was that bad. No, no your face. I don't see blood on it. Hush now, child. You're okay. You just had a bad dream. No, I know what I saw. I... Shh. It's okay. She holds me and tells me it's all right in a soft voice and that I was attacked by an animal. It was okay to be scared and confused. Anyone would be after that. But it's safe now. You're safe. It's all over. I calm down a bit as she rubs my head. Get some more rest. You might have some visitors in the morning. It's okay. They just want to help you remember what happened to you. She tucks me into bed again and puts the cookies in a glass of water on the table next to my bed and walks to the door again. Like in my dream, my heart starts to pump as she stops and turns around again like in my dream, but she isn't torn up this time. Get some rest. I mean it, she tells me. I will come back to check on you later tonight, she says to me as she turns the light off and closes the door. Relieved that her face was normal, I laid back in bed as so many things rush into my mind as I try to remember what had gone on that night. What kind of animal was it? I can't remember anything, I thought to myself as I slowly slipped back to sleep. Wake up, Tommy. It's your dad. I open my eyes. The daylight shines through the now open window. I close them again quickly as the light is bright and hurts them. You okay, buddy? You had us scared. Hey, Dad. I'm sorry, I tell my father as I struggle to see him. I was watching Josh, and I don't know what happened. Is he okay? Where is he? It's okay, buddy. He's in the hall with your mother. Can I see him? Sure. I'll go get him for you. My father opens the door and calls out to my little brother. Tommy's up. Come talk to your brother. He steps to the side as my little brother runs in. 
Tommy, he says as he hugs me. You're okay. Yes, little man, I'm fine. Takes more than a few scratches to stop me. Dad closes the door as he steps out into the hall. Tommy, the monster was trying to eat you, he said all hyper. Whoa, slow down. What monster, Josh? It was like a bear or a large dog, not a monster. Just then, a flash of memory rushes back to me. I see it for a second before I pass out. Its eyes, its large glowing yellow eyes, with the look of hate in them, it's all I could see now that I remember. Josh, do me a favor. Tell everyone it was a bear that you saw, that a bear attacked me. But why, Tommy? It was a... I stopped him to say. Just say it was a bear. When they ask you, okay, buddy? Can you do that for me? Okay, Tommy, I will, he tells me as he wipes his nose from the sleeve of his shirt. We can't tell people what we saw. They might split us up. No one will believe what we saw. They'll think we're crazy, and we can't do that to mom and dad. Okay, Tommy, he says again in a low tone. Now go tell mom and dad they could come back in. He hugs me tight and then goes to the door to tell them that it's okay to come back in. When a man in a long black coat walks in instead of my dad. Go see your mom's son, the man tells my little brother as he walks into the room. Josh looks at him and runs out. The man closes the door and lights up a cigarette. You know why you're in the hospital, right? I tell the man as he lights up. He takes a long pull on it and blows out at me. You're not going to die from a little smoke, son. Hell, I could smoke everyone on me. You won't die, he tells me as he blows out another blast. The man was tall and slim with blue eyes and a black Stetson cowboy hat with a long black coat wrapped around him. He looked like he had just stepped out of an old western movie. He must have been around in his 50s or so as his wrinkled tan covered his face. It looked like he had worked out in the sun his whole life. Who does he think he is with that cowboy hat on? Clint Eastwood? Are you the police? I ask the man as he takes off his hat and puts it on the sink. No, son. I'm not a cop. What do you want then? I ask the man as he sits across from me. I need to ask you a few questions, son. I stare at the man with big eyes and a confused look. Oh no, he knows something, but what? Calm down, boy. You look like a hog about to be slaughtered. Like I said before, I'm not a cop. The animal that attacked you, did you see it, boy? I better play dumb. Don't want anyone to know what I saw. I looked at the man and told him with a surprised look. No, it was all so fast. I passed out before I could. Shut up, boy. I know you saw it. You saw the beast, didn't you? What do you mean, a beast? It was a bear from what they tell me. No, boy. You know and I know that's horseshit. You were attacked by a large canine beast that walked on two legs, not four. Am I right? The man asked me in an impatient tone. I stuttered as I tried to answer the man. He slaps the bed right next to my leg and says... Well, boy? Yes, it was a beast. I saw its face of the dog and its yellow eyes looking at me as it was going to kill me, I told the man. My words poured out with sobs what it was. What was the beast that tried to kill me? The man looked at me with a look of doom. Son, you were bitten by a werewolf. And I thought I was crazy for telling myself it was a beast, and now you're telling me it was a werewolf-like in the movies? You must drink a lot, don't you? The man takes his long black coat off and then his shirt. See this boy? He tells me as he points to some nasty scars on his chest and arm. I start to turn my head as it was something I didn't want to see. No boy, look, he said. Look at the slashes I have on me. A werewolf did this to me. I'm only here today because a good friend saved me. He gave his life so that I could get away. My stomach started to turn from the side of it. Why are you showing me this? He turns to pick up his shirt and starts to put it back on. Then he tells me, I showed you this because I got a good slash from it. You got a bite by it. You only get the curse from a bite, not a scratch. See what I'm saying, boy? No, you're crazy. I can't be a werewolf. You came in with deep bite marks and deep lacerations on your back and shoulder. 
I know this because I patched you up that night. I was tracking it when I lost him. I heard your brother's cries and ran over and I got you and it was already sinking its teeth into you. I shot at it and it ran off, but I did not get a good hit because I was trying to not shoot you. I guess I should thank you then. No boy. If I wasn't so soft hearted, I would have shot you that night and be done with it. Now you too will become one. You will change and you will hunt. No! Stop that now, he said with an evil smirk. At least not without a silver bullet blessed by a monk. You have been watching too many old movies. You're nuts! I'm not a werewolf! Keep telling yourself that, boy. You will see when the moon is full and the hunger takes over you. You would wish you would listen to me. The man walked to the door. Wait, stop. What can I do? What can I do to stop this from happening? Two ways you could do it, boy. Eat a silver bullet, or kill the one who bit you. Not an easy choice, is it, boy? The man opened the door and turns and looked at me one last time. By the way, boy, the one who did it to you had four claw marks across his face. It only goes by the name of Savage. No one knows his real name, or how old he is, but he's been killing for a very long time. You will never kill him, boy. He is too smart and even more powerful than the rest. The rest, you mean, there's more? Yes, boy, but your fright isn't with them. Most keep to the treaty and stay hidden. That is, until some fat little piggy stumbles into their home. If you want to kill him, talk to the man named Red Crow. You can find him on one of the Crow's tribe's reservations. The man nods to my family, then walks off. After a few more days, I was discharged from the hospital. Dad picks me up and takes me home. My home doesn't feel the same as it was before as I walk around and head to my room. Sitting on my bed, I grab my laptop and search the Crow tribe, in hopes of maybe they could help me. My search leads to a website. Seems that they live in Montana. Josh knocks on my door and peeks in at me. What are you doing, Tommy? My little brother asks me as he walks in and makes himself comfortable next to me. It's okay, little man. I'm just looking stuff up. Are you looking for the monster, Tommy? Yes, buddy, I am. That old man told me how to fix everything, but I have to go away for a while. Can I go to help with you? I have five dollars mom gave me for candy. Looking at him, I tell Josh, no, buddy, it'll be okay. Just a few days or a week, and I'll be back, but don't tell mom and dad. I will tell them that I'm going to Uncle Mark's cabin for a bit to catch up on some fishing and rest up. I was 17 at the time, and going to the cabin was what my family did for fun from time to time. Even though I stayed inside for most of the trip, it was fun being there. Josh gets up and asks to play one of my games. Sure, buddy. Anyone you want. Need me to set it up for you? No, I got it, he tells me. As he plays some video games, I continue to finish looking up the Crow's tribe history. Turns out that they have the belief that the old man Coyote played the role of both creator and trickster in the Croth mythology. In some versions of the Crow creation myth, there were two Coyotes, the old man Coyote who played people, animals, and the earth, and the regular Coyote who had adventures and got into trouble. In other versions, they were the same. I put my laptop down and walked to the desk. Guess I should write to mom and dad, telling them a note that I was going to the cabin. I gave it to Josh and told him to give it to them after I'm gone. That night, I packed up and started to leave for the cabin, when getting part way down the street, I dropped to my knees in pain. I struggled to my feet again and managed to hide in the back alley. It would be the first time I changed and the one that I didn't remember about other than the pain trying to hide myself. I must have passed out before the change took over me. The next day, I wake up in a strange backyard with a dog barking at me with a part of a dead cat by the head and some old lady telling me to get out of her yard hitting me with a broom. Naked and confused by what had happened to me, I headed back to the house. I sneaked into my room and cleaned up and put on some clean clothes. Just then, I get flashes of things popping up in my head, like a dream running and jumping walking on the top of roofs. I had turned into a beast that night, and it was all coming back to me. Still a little confused, I tell myself it's time to go. I can't stay here any longer. 
everyone is still sleeping, I grab a few more things from the fridge and head out again, not wanting to wake the house and get stopped by anyone. That was two years ago. Two long years have gone by. I'm 19 now. A few days and maybe a week has turned in the two years. My little brother must think that I had abandoned him, but that's not true. I'm doing this for him and everyone that I love, not just for revenge, but so that no one else will have to go through it like me. Having made my way to the Red Crow's home three weeks after leaving my own, having arrived on the reservation, I knocked on the door, and a guy with braided hair and a white t-shirt comes to the door. Are you Red Crow? I ask him as he looks me up and down. Yeah, who's asking? I tell him my name. I'm Tommy, and I was told you might be able to help me. Do you know of a man known as Savage? The man's eyes widen and he slams the door on me. Go away, he yells at me from behind it. Please help me. Please, Mr. Red Crow. The man or beast tried to kill me and my little brother. After telling him my story through the door, I heard the lock open and the door slowly opens with the man looking at me in the eyes. Come in, but make it quick. I can't be part of this. If he finds out, he will kill me and everyone I know. Well, don't just stand there looking dumb. Come in before someone sees you. I go into his house, closing the door, and sit on the retro-looking chair next to the 1970s TV. The house smelled of smoke and bottles were on the floor scattered everywhere. Thinking to myself, how can someone live like this? The man looked at me and with a harsh voice tells me to spill everything I wanted to say, that I only had ten minutes before I had the talk before I had the go. So I retold him everything that had happened to me. Looking conflicted, the man tells me, Yes, I know the savage. He killed my wife. She was pregnant with our firstborn. That son of a whore killed the only two things I loved in this world. I could see it in your face that you're one of those wolves with a man's skin over him. Not knowing what to say to the man, he tells me the story of Akba Atatia, Old Man Coyote. He goes on to say that he was the creator of everything, even the wolf with the man's skin on him, and how only the wolf with a man's skin can kill him. You must have no fear in your heart and be ready to die if you want to kill him. Many have tried in the past and failed, losing their lives, and like me, had loved ones killed and eaten by him. I looked for him for a long time, but he was too smart to stay in one place for long. But he has a town he returns to over time. It's called Cova do Lobo, Wolf's Pit. Now get out of my house, and don't come back. Don't tell anyone I told you where he goes. With that, I take my leave and head out to where the Red Crow said he might be. Oh God, it's starting again. I wake from my delirious dream state recalling the past and how I got there. My body continues to twist and contort and transform. It's all over. No longer before, I'm no longer myself. My now dagger-filled mouth begins to become wider and stretched out. I could feel the fur pushing its way out and covering my body. Then the pain just stops. In fact, I feel good. Very good. I try to open my eyes again, but this time they open. Like a newborn baby, I see with new eyes for the first time. The world is the same, but different. It's brighter. Looking around, I could see and hear things that I would have never known were there before. Not five feet from me was a mouse making its way through the bed of hay I was resting on. I didn't see him, but I could see the heat from it, even hear its tiny heartbeat. What was going on? This is new. How was I able to control myself this time? I could move my hands, and the beast wasn't in charge of me this time. I was awake and coherent, and the feeling was so good and it was overwhelming me. I felt as though I could take on anyone, anything, nothing could stop me. Then it hit me like a ton of bricks. The hunger welled up inside of me to eat. I'm so hungry. I have never been so starving in my life. And like a dinner bell ringing, I hear the low moo of a cow. A small farm was just over the hill. I could smell everything, even the minute traces of soap on the young girl, who was picking up tools her family had used that day and locking things up after them. I sprang to my new fur-covered feet and darted out into the night. 
The hunt had started, and I was off to my first meal. Before I knew it, I was in a tree overlooking the farm. I could now see the young girl cleaning up after everyone. She had fair skin and long red hair and a ponytail that draped down the back of her overalls. She was humming as she went about her work, so happy and carefree, as she put the last of the tools in the shed. I could feel my heart racing. Something in me was starting to take over. The control I was so happy to have over the beast was fading fast. What I once had was almost gone. Something primal was taking over me. No, I can't do this. I don't want to be a killer. Stop it. But the beast was fighting me for control now. My new athletic body was fast and quiet with a blink of an eye. I was halfway to my young, unsuspecting victim. When BAM! A loud shot rang out and something hit the ground next to me, missing my leg by a hair. The girl's father had been watching her clean up and got a shot off before I could get to her. Screams from the now brightly lit house rang out, cries from the young girl's father telling her to get inside quick. The girl dropped everything in her pale hands and ran as fast as she could to the house with her father. More screams started from the farmhand's house. Men with axes and pitchforks came out yelling at me to go away and to get out of here, demon beast. With that, the beast decided to run off and avoid any further conflict with the people of the now engaged house. I could hear cries of profanity behind me as I ran. The overwhelming smell of sulfur filled the air from the guns. I ran deep and far into the wood line. The voices had faded, and I was out of shot range by now. Stopping by a large fallen tree that was hollow on one side, I sat my sore body on it, only realizing I had been shot several times, but with the chaos going on and my adrenaline pumping, I didn't feel it until I stopped running. The pain started to set in, and I passed out from it. I woke up the next day covered in dirt and blood, but the blood all over me was mine. Feeling relieved I had not killed that young girl, I noticed all my wounds were healed, not a mark on me, and the pain was gone too. The curse was keeping me alive and healthy. In that instant, it hit me. I was almost immortal. Only silver, decapitation, and another werewolf could kill me now. Not a happy thought. But now I know I could kill the one who did this to me. The man with the four claw marks across his face. The one who was known only as the Savage. <laughs>